I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be fired forever. I was day playing on Euphoria and we were on the Sony lot. Zendaya had to, she had to go do some ADR on another part of the lot. And I had never, I had never really been to the Sony lot before. They explained how to get there. But if you've ever been on the Sony lot, I drove Zendaya over. I got like halfway there. And then I was like, I think I'm going the right way. And she was just like, she's like, yeah, I think it's over there. I was like, oh my God, I lost one of the most famous people on the planet. Welcome to The Practical Filmmaker, an educational podcast brought to you by the Filmmaker Institute and Sunscreen Film Festival, where industry professionals talk nuts and bolts and the steps they took to find their success today. On today's show, BJ Passinger gives us an inside look into the art of breaking into Hollywood by way of PAing and lessons he's learned along his way to becoming a writer. Find the full transcripts and more at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. I'm your host, Tanya Musgrave, and today we have BJ Passinger, who's been making his way in LA for the past six years, working steadily as a PA on the Universal Backlot on shows like Home and Family, on NBC commercials, and most recently, HBO's Insecure. Before I welcome him to the show, just a slight disclaimer, technical flub on my part, a setting got flipped on Zoom, so it actually didn't record through my mic. So I apologize for your ears today. You'll have to muster through listening to slightly cruddy audio on my part, but BJ comes through fantastically loud and clear without further ado, BJ Passinger. Hey, Tanya. It's <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> hey, hey. So I want you to set the stage for us. How did you get where you are right now? Well, I guess the the catalyst really began with my friend Julio, who I think has been a guest on the podcast. We were leaving work at home and family, and this show was shooting right next to us. And Julio was like, man, I'm tired of like doing all this extra stuff. Like, PA shouldn't have to do some of this stuff. And then he was like, I'm going to go talk to somebody over at that shoot and give them my resume. And uh, he went and... Uh, just talked to this guy, and uh, the guy was like, um, yeah, uh, here, let me get your number. And then he was like, I'm going to pass your name on to this show. If they hit you up, just tell them you worked with me on blah, 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 so-and-so show. <laughs> and nice. Julio did that, and then he got a job. Uh, he was day playing on uh, Animal Kingdom, yeah. and then things started kind of tracking for him and then after a little bit after about a year and a half of him pestering me like are you gonna quit home and family or not you don't want to be there and you know and he's my he's my friend like he's one of those friends that's always like will just call you on your bs almost if yeah, he just, yeah, yeah, yeah if he feels if he feels like you're not living up to your potential he's that's like a good friend. what's wrong with he's like what's wrong with you yeah, yeah and like you'll be like you're like Ugh. and then, <laughs> um but then, uh, yeah, so finally I quit, and it was terrifying. I quit January of 2018, so that was basically almost a full two years after working at home and family, mm-hmm. almost five days a week consistently, yeah. so getting a, a paycheck. Steady, steady yeah, game. getting a paycheck every Friday. It was one of those things where it's like it's a steady paycheck, mm-hmm. but I wasn't going to be meeting any of the people that were trying to do the same things that I was doing. Yeah. I was meeting other PAs that also didn't, want to be at Hallmark or be in that part of the industry. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I wasn't really meeting anyone that could kind of pivot me mm-hmm. in towards narrative work. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. And then, so I had about two months of just being at home. I was doing random little commercials here and there for uh, mm-hmm. one of my college friends, uh, Lucas, who's mm-hmm. like a producer over at NBC. Yeah. Lucas Tanaka and, was actually on the show too. But uh, so I was kind of dipping into my savings and doing that here and there. And then like right the first week of March, Julio texted me and said, hey, I just got staffed on this show, Insecure. They're going to need some additional PAs probably this first week. I think I can get you on. And I was like, all right, cool. And then he was like, just just don't screw up and make me look bad. And I was like, all right, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, so I got over to Insecure. I had day played on other random narrative shows here and there, mm-hmm. like while I was at home and family, just through random little gigs that Julio could throw me. Yeah. And I would just like scramble last second. Sometimes I would call in sick mm-hmm. to yeah. <laughs> take off from home and family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Basically, yeah, the first day ended up, you know, I got put on lockup. So just keeping people 
out of the shots, keeping mm-hmm. people quiet when they're rolling, yeah. uh, stuff like that. They liked me, so they kept bringing me back here and there. And then the other big thing that I got put on, like the first or second day that I was at Insecure, um, I got put in charge of getting breakfast for cast and right. other higher ups. Yeah. So I would get a couple of days a week on Insecure. Mm-hmm. Um, it would vary anywhere from two to five days. And I had a couple of weeks where I just didn't get any work from them at all. But mm-hmm. that went on from March until the beginning of June 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, but over the course of that time, I was, organically, I was able to develop a relationship yeah. with uh, the second second AD. Uh, yeah, his name's yeah. James James Chestnut. I was always one of the PAs that I was just, I didn't want to get accused of uh trying to milk the clock or anything like that yeah, at yeah. rap. So I'd always ask him a lot. They did a lot of location shoots that, that season. And so our base camp was at the forum in Inglewood a lot. Mm. And we, we also did a lot of night shoots and mm-hmm. sometimes like Friday night. So it'd be, yeah. there'd be, it'd be six 30 in the morning on a Saturday and I'd be like, Oh man, I've been on the clock for like 15 hours. Oh I, hope gonna be, I, like, I hope they're not going to be mad at me. Yeah. Like, I don't want them to think that I'm trying to like just milk the clock or anything. Yeah, yeah. And I'd go up to James like, Hey man, uh, I, I've been on the clock for a while. Like, are they, like, do I need to go home or anything like that? Mm-hmm. And he put his hand on, he put his hand on my shoulder and just go, stay with me, bro. And I'd be like, <laughs> all right, James, I got you, man, whatever you need. <laughs> and that was, he was one of those people that season. And I, uh, cause I would get breakfast for him pretty frequently. Uh, so I, I like memorized his breakfast order mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. Eggs, two slices of bacon, toast, <laughs> and avocado. <laughs> yep. There you go. <laughs> but you know, James, James ended up being uh, like a really good person for me to know because that summer, uh, right after Insecure ended, I went to Africa for like two weeks uh, with mm. my college roommate, and right when I got back. I just reached out to James like, hey, I'm back in town, blah, blah, blah. And he had just got on this uh, McG movie, uh, Rim of the World, mm-hmm. and he was able to get me on there. So Rim of the World pretty much helped pay my bills for about a month and a half. And then mm-hmm. at the beginning of August, I got a random text from this person that said, hey, I got your contact information from Julio. Uh, I'm on this show called Vita. We're looking to interview hey. some PAs. Uh, would you like to come in and interview? And I said, yeah, sure, that'd be great. I got to the interview, and the key second AD and the first AD, uh, Sally and Aaron, they introduced themselves, blah, blah, blah. The first thing they said was, so we understand you speak fluent Spanish. My eyes went wide, and I was like, oh, uh, I don't speak Spanish, like, really <laughs> at all. And then they looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they laughed, and then just said, it's okay, we don't speak Spanish either. It's, it's not a job requirement. It's helpful, but it's not a job requirement. And I was like, okay. Phew. They were looking at my references and stuff. They knew one AD that I had day played for here and there while I was still at home and family that I mm-hmm. met through Julio. Uh, they saw her name, and like, oh, you know Alex? Oh, we love Alex. Mm. And then they saw James's name. And James had PA'd for them oh, when okay. they were first AD, when like when they were ADing, and uh, they said, "Oh, you know James? Oh, we love James." Yeah, so I essentially I got hired to be the walkie PA, so I was in mm-hmm. charge of keeping up with every single walkie that the production rented and distributed, and yeah. I had to keep up with those for the two and a half, three months that the show ran, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was a good time. It was a great learning experience. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then after Vita was... Uh, I went and day played on Euphoria. Okay. Uh, James had gone over to Euphoria. And then Alex, another AD that I had worked for before as a day player, she was over there. Okay. And then Sally, uh, my first AD from Vita, was also a first AD over there. Where are you right now? What, is, what does life look like right now? Ooh, uh, well, right now I'm back to day playing. Uh-huh. I staffed two shows back to back i staffed uh hbo's uh generation in november 2019 and that went until march 2020 Mm -hmm. or 2021 and then i went and finished out insecure i was the background pa on both of those shows Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and insecure ended the first like june 14th i think yeah something like that and then I went home for two weeks, and then I was kind of day playing here and there. Okay, I all right. spent I spent a week like on a 
secret movie that I signed at NDA. <laughs> so I can't, I can't say anything. Okay, okay. It's, uh, some, some Oscar winners are involved. Yes. And then, uh, and then I've been, and then I've been day playing. You see. Okay. All right. Since then. Nice. Okay. So for the people who are literally just, just starting out, um, the difference between day playing and getting staffed, what is the pivot point there? Well, honestly, it's kind of the luck of the draw, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because it just, it, one, it is always about who, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is always helpful. Like I said, when I got hired for Vita, I happened yeah. to know two people yeah. that, those ADs worked with a lot that they loved, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. And sometimes it's just personal preference because I know a lot of people that have been PAing for several years and they just don't like to staff anymore. Why? Because staffing can be a lot, especially if you're if you get booked on a show that's going to shoot six months, which doesn't always happen. But there are shows that will run six months. Uh, my buddy Julio, when he was on SEAL Team, SEAL Team would go from... I think they would go from like July to March or something. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. would go, they would go nine months. Mm -hmm. And so nine months is a long time to do five days a week, mm. 15, 16 hour days sometimes. Yeah. Um, not really having that flexibility. And not really having that flexibility. And so I just, I know a lot of people that will do that. And then there's also people that after they've staffed a certain amount of times, they've start because people, a lot of people that are PAs, are uh, they're collecting days mm -hmm. to get into the director's guild so that mm -hmm. they can hopefully eventually AD in Los Angeles or Atlanta or wherever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I know people that it's like, you know, th if they have four or 500 days already mm -hmm. and they're not hurting for money, they're not jumping to staff. And some people just yeah. like the flexibility. Is there, is there like how much, is there much of a pay difference between like day playing and staff? Oh yeah, I mean that's that yeah. can be. I mean it can be a huge difference. It just depends. Um, but I mean staffing, you're gonna be there five days a week. Mm -hmm. It's just more consistent, gonna, I guess. Yeah, it's just more yeah. consistent. It's the consistency. So really, it's about what you're comfortable with and mm -hmm. how much money you want to have, mm -hmm. and and also you know how much stress and sleep you want to have. <laughs> Yeah, how much do you uh, want your soul to be sucked dry? That's the question. Exactly, at times, yeah. <laughs> Although, like, there's some shows that, like, you'll, you know, I've I've been really blessed that most of the shows that I have staffed, the ADs are great, the other PAs are great, the crew. I've been blessed that I've been on mostly shows that everybody's just great. Yeah. So even if you're working the really crazy hours, mm -hmm. you're not like, this is terrible. <laughs> what, have, what have I done to myself? Like, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what have I done? Oh, man. So, I mean, all right. Being great to work with and what you were saying before, it's like, you know, kind of about who you know. If there's anything that I know that, like, our, our particular circle says about you is that, like, number one, you're great to work with. <laughs> and number two, I try. that you are just, like, really, really great at networking. You're just a fantastic networker. Yeah, I know. Like, is, well, is that a surprise to you that, that they would say that um, about you? Well, I, I would say yes and no. I'm I'm definitely I've heard a people. That from literally I'm in, like three different I'm in, sources. I'm an introvert, but I am a people person, and yeah. so it's very. Uh, I'm just naturally I'm able to get along with people from all walks of life. Just uh -huh. yeah. for some reason, that's how I'm wired, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and that's helpful. That's definitely been helpful as a background PA. Yeah. Um, because I I had an AD say that to me on Insecure. She just said she said. I just don't know how you're able to deal with all these backgrounds sometimes. You just always seem so calm and not stressed. And I said, oh, I said, oh, Cindy, I'm hiding it real well, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that, was, that was hilarious because, like, my my next question for you was literally going to be, like, just for my own curiosity of, like, whether or not you were an introvert or an extrovert. Because, like, I'm always curious how, like, I wonder how our introvert our introverted friends do and like how they handle this business I'm, when networking is such a huge part of it. I'm an extroverted introvert, if mm. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I can come off as an extrovert, but I definitely have that limit where it's just all of a sudden it's like a switch flips. Yeah. And I'm like, I need to go be by myself now. <laughs> but then what after is... after a little bit, I'm immediately like, okay, I need to be around human beings right mm. now. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Like, so... 
have you noticed, I mean, man, I, I think it's just a thing of getting older because, <laughs> uh, you know, you start to balance out a little bit. Introverts become mm-hmm. a little bit more extroverted, extroverts. Mm-hmm. Like I definitely, I have those cave days where I'm just like, nah, no, nah, I'm not going <laughs> <Like, I, laughs> yeah, to, I'm just exactly. like, no, I'm going to sit here with my puzzle and I'm not going to talk to anybody. But I have noticed some limitations with, you know, cause I just came off of a production and I remember pulling, you know, like those 3 a.m. kind of nights and oh my gosh, I was useless for like a day and a half after I did like three of those in a row. I'm just like, I just don't bounce back. Is there some way that you particularly like for, for the introverted uh, peeps out there who are trying to make mm-hmm. it in this big old world? <laughs> um, yeah. um, I don't know. Like what are some of the things that you do to recharge? Uh, oh, to recharge. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Or just to like cut out, like, I mean, because you have to work, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of times I'll, depending on how stacked my bank account is after mm. I finish a job, it is um, motivating. I will spend at least, I'll usually spend at least two days where I'm just not doing anything. I'm mm-hmm. probably post-mating Chipotle and mm-hmm. watching TV and playing video <laughs> games with yeah. like my college friends. Mm-hmm. But then this last time, right after Insecure ended, I flew to Utah and visited one of my childhood friends for a couple nice. of days and we just checked out some yeah. of Utah. I wasn't yeah. able to stay long enough. But then and then I and then I went home for almost 10 days. I had a wedding in Atlanta oh, I had nice. to go to and nice. then and then and then I went back to Nashville and saw my family <laughs> yeah. and stuff and So you just check out, you know, not like yeah. no, no, I I totally understand. And I'm sure very and, yeah. And and one thing that's helpful for me too and it's every time I finish a job I'm always like, I I have the same moment where I'm like, oh my God, where's my next job going to come from? Mm -hmm. I'm never going to work again. And then a job (laughs) always comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as I've been in the business long enough, I've kind of learned that it's okay to take some time for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's necessary. Um, Yeah. And I've, I've definitely, you know, I've had some, I've had some health things I've had to deal with over the last couple of years here and there. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where the industry is going to be there and the long and the longer you're here, if you have to take a month and even if you have to take a year, you know, I'm trying to avoid ever having to take a year off. But if I did, I know enough people that if I disappeared for a year and then came back, mm-hmm. I probably would be able to still get plenty of work. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's really important to know that, you know, I, I think sometimes people just need permission because I remember feeling, I don't know, like lazy, you know, mm-hmm. when I really need it. Cause like I would, I would do some of these international gigs and I'd come back and I just, like, I would not talk to anybody and not do anything for literally a solid week. And I'm just like, man, I am so lazy. Why can't oh, I yeah. not just like keep up with stuff? No, like giving yourself permission to recharge and, you know, get- Oh yeah. And that's, that's a big thing with me, especially like for my writing, mm. because I'm always trying to write as much as I can. Uh, in 2020, I was able to write two original features and uh and and do another draft of a pilot that i'd written the prior Mm -hmm. year Mm -hmm. um that was partially due to the pandemic but uh the last feature that i wrote towards the end of the year i I wrote that while i was staffing Mm -hmm. um which Mm -hmm. was really hard so i was writing on weekends pretty much i would try to just say okay i'm gonna pump out 10 to 15 pages this weekend i'm just gonna force myself to do it yeah yeah but then you know you have times where you just you just can't write, you can't be in production and write at the same time. And you also have personal stuff that you have to take care of. You have your health Mm -hmm. and you got your friends and family you have to, and then 2020 especially, I really wanted to kind of work on my mental health a little bit more. So I did therapy and Mm -hmm. I had just started therapy when I got the call to go interview for Generation. And then I was up front with them. I said, hey, you know, two two different people that knew James and uh, mm-hmm. another person that I PA'd with had given uh, this AD, Denise, my contact info. And I just, I told her, I said, hey, you know, I really want to work for you. I could definitely use the money right now. But I literally just started therapy again. Mm-hmm. I'm doing it, you know, I'm doing it every other Wednesday night from seven to eight which is the Mm -hmm. only time my therapist had open at that time yeah yeah. and uh because of how many people were trying to do therapy because of how crazy 2020 was yeah yeah seriously and And, like artists too yeah exactly exactly and she 
and she said, she said, okay, um, let me talk to the, let me talk to the first ADs about that. Um, and I'll get back with you. And then maybe a day or two later, she called me back and she just said, Hey, I uh, talked to the first ADs. They think that's great that you're trying to take care of your mental health and more people go. in our, and, and we all think that more people in our business should be taking care of their mental health. So Preach. yeah, we'll make that work. Preach. <laughs> And then I was able to get to the point over the course of the show, like I want to say the last month of the show, I had kind of gotten to the point where I had worked everything out that I needed mm-hmm. to work out. And I was yeah. kind of already feeling like I was in a place where I didn't need therapy anymore. Mm-hmm. And even and then my therapist, when I called my therapist, he said, actually, I was going to tell you the same thing. I don't hey. think, and I, was, and I said, well, if you don't think I need it, then I guess I'm okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> No, but that's so that's so amazing to see because, you know, talking to I don't know some of the old timers that you know I, I remember talking to Corey Pollard a lot about it, about this because like he was you know from a different era where it's just mm-hmm. like you know rub some dirt in it like <laughs> Hollywood yeah. doesn't have time for this oh yeah um, and it, it, he one of the things that he did mention was that it was so encouraging to see a present generation coming up mm-hmm. that would actually have boundaries and say no and you know be able to take care of well, themselves the way that they needed to a lot of the unions right now are pushing hard for 10 hour days especially because mm-hmm. we're you know we're still in the pandemic people mm-hmm. feel like we're not but we are especially in LA County you know mm-hmm. I've been seeing so many posts where people are trying to push for 10 hour days and making mm-hmm. basically making that the norm wow. um yeah. so that people That'd can awesome. have lives and <laughs> yeah. that would you yeah. know so that people can have lives <laughs> that people people can see their children other than yeah. the weekends and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh and I think that's great um yeah. Yeah. I'm not in a union, so hopefully the unions will work that out. But I'm not going to. I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to be upset if I can still pay all my bills and work ten hours a day instead of twelve to mm-hmm. sixteen. I'm not going to yeah. be mad. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Okay, so I mean, we're gonna like you touched a little bit on the writing, so we're gonna vis- visit that a little bit yeah. later. But um, for those coming into the business and are faced with the reality of doing PA work for a while, because like you know, there are some people yeah. who are just like, wait, what? No, 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 I'm gonna be a director as soon as I get there. Um, so they might be a little bit, you know, misinformed or yeah. like discouraged at the thought of it. But like, what would you say to them? Well, one, it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> yeah. Two, right, right. One thing that I've been learning slowly, because this business is all about relationships and connections and stuff Absolutely. like that, you're gonna have your best luck meeting people that are also on the same level as you. It helps to meet people that are up top, but the executive producer of Insecure is not gonna be able to do anything for me. You know, he can mm-hmm. hire me as an assistant. You know, he could recommend, you know, if he had read one of my scripts or something, so this is great. He could pass my stuff on to a manager and maybe get me a meeting, you know what I mean? But he's not going to, it's not going to suddenly fast track me. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it happens very rarely. If you're not Damien Chazelle, the odds of you not having to do the work mm-hmm. and make the connections and make the genuine connections, you know, that's, you know, my, but my buddy Julio, we met at work, but we became genuine friends outside of work. Yeah. And so he's got like, and that has helped me genuinely because like, regardless of what's going on in the business, like we are just genuine friends. We text each other all the mm-hmm. time. Like I know mm-hmm. his mom, like I bet yeah. you know what I mean? It's like one of those things yeah, yeah. where and it's you guys just, are going to fight for each other, you know? It, like, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And like push and, and that's kind of the biggest important thing, you know. It's it's helpful to meet, at least for PAs and stuff. It's helpful to meet other PAs because the majority of the work that I've gotten has been through. I mean, some ads hit me up, but sometimes it's just simply like if you have a relationship with another PA, and they're they're staffed on a show, and you're looking for work, and mm-hmm. they're in the AD trailer, and they're like, hey, we need five more PAs for tomorrow. Anybody got any names? Yeah. You know, they're going to be like, 100%. oh, hey, I know this person, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. like, yeah, and they can vouch hypo- for that. Yeah, hypothetical. Yeah, if they vouch for you. Yeah, because that's the thing. As long as someone vouches for you and you don't screw up too, ba- <laughs> too bad, everyone's yeah. allowed to make a little mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, nothing crazy, crazy. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you know, that, wanna- that's the big thing, you know. I want to hear, I want to hear about a mistake. I would love, I would love for you to tell me a story about something that went wrong. So something that went wrong for me that ended up, it turned out okay. But in the moment I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be fired forever. (laughs) Um, I was day playing on Euphoria and we were on the Sony lot. 
and I'd been helping out. There were a lot of cast members that day, and so I'd been helping out, just driving them to and from the stages and stuff. Uh, and Zendaya had to; she had to go do some ADR in another part of the lot. And I had never, I had never really been to the Sony lot before. They explained how to get there, but if you've ever been on the Sony lot, it is not. The Sony lot is much more compact and there's way more buildings that are put together than right. when you're on the Universal lot. It's a lot easier. Certain lots are just easier to navigate. Yeah. I drove Zendaya over. I got like halfway there and then I was like, I think I'm going the right way. And she was just like, she's like, yeah, I think it's over there. And then went back to texting on her phone and I was like, and then like, I kind of got lost, and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. She's like, it's cool, it's cool. I, I, I think it's over there, though. Let's try over there. And then we ended up finding it. After, like, two tries, we found yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, um, and the, the thing about Zendaya, too, is, like, because I'm, I'm a little bit older, so, like, I didn't, I didn't understand how big of a deal she was until I got to Euphoria. Mm. And the first day we were on location, we were shooting at this school, and while school was in session, classes broke and all of a sudden you just hear and i was locking up somewhere and all of a sudden you just hear a girl screaming bloody murder <laughs> and i was like what is going on and somebody else was like oh, i think somebody just saw zendaya like i think that's it that that's literally it that's all it is and so i just yeah, like, didn't oh, fathom because yeah because i didn't under you know I'm not a massive like Marvel fan, so I hadn't like I hadn't really seen I hadn't seen the Spider Man movies that she's yeah, in. Yeah. And I and I didn't I I had stopped watching Disney Channel a long time yeah, before she was yeah. on Disney Channel. So I just I just didn't know. Oh and then so when I went when I got sent back to go pick her up, I got there I got there on the first try. And then when I got to the when I got up top to where they were recording, uh the guy was like, Oh, she just she just left. She just walked out the other side. And so I was like, oh, crap. And I like ran downstairs and she was gone. I got down like she she's tall. So she has really long strides, like really long. She was gone. And I was like, oh, my God, I lost. I was like, I lost Zendaya. I'm going to be fired. <laughs> I am fired. And I just like oh and I was like, oh, and then I call. I was like looking around. I'm looking around and I just I don't see her. And. And then I call I call Susan, uh, the base camp AD, and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like she was gone when I got there. I lost her. And Susan was like, oh, it's okay. She's she just got to base camp. It's all good. <laughs> and she she's like, it's fine. Where like no one no one's gonna mob her on the Sony lot. Like it's it's fine. Oh and I was like, okay. I was like, all right. I'm not in trouble. She's like, no, it's fine. Just come back to base camp. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> But I was ter I was terrified in the moment. I was like, oh my I was like, oh my god, I lost one of the most famous people on the planet. Like Well, I mean, at the very least, all you would have to do is just follow the screams. Like follow the screams exactly. and then yeah. like and then, you know, deal with all the repercussions of having to pay for her uh injury bills for like all of her mobbing fans. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I remember someone told me once that like the first years in LA, they're kind of like like basically another degree. Everyone that I've talked to, and, and I always have to remind myself this too, whether you're a writer, whether you're a producer, blah, blah, blah. It takes a solid 10 years at least, just mm -hmm. in general in the industry, yeah. because you have to work on your craft. You have to meet people. It's always about luck and timing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first met James, the, the AD from Insecure, Insecure was his very first show getting to work as a second, second AD for mm -hmm. the DGA in Los Angeles. He had just finished up all of his third area days and been approved to work as a second, second AD in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. He had just turned 31, like maybe a week before he got hired to be on Insecure. I think he moved out here when he was like 22, 23, like right after mm -hmm. college, the same way I did. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, I mean, that's a solid eight years before mm -hmm. of pa -ing. Yeah, He was a PA yeah. for eight years, mm -hmm. which is, you know, like I said, you can do the Damien Chazelle thing. Sometimes it's about who you know, too, because sometimes, yeah. you know, if you don't know anybody, it's can be hard to even just get a PA job or the mm -hmm. right P the right PA job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on a project based industry, yeah, you have to know you have to like you know diversify. That's our version of diversifying our portfolio. Oh, ab so, absolutely, and yeah. and also for somebody like me because I until I'm comfortable around, I have a hard time speaking up 
kind mm. of, you know, because I, I don't ever want anyone to think that I just want something from them. Mm -hmm. So I have a, I always have a hard time letting just introducing myself sometimes until I'm comfortable around people yeah. or introducing myself to like higher ups. My, one of my professors in college, David, George, he'd always say uh, I, the, he was the first person I think I ever heard say this squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm hmm. And so <laughs> mm -hmm. that's and like to this day, like that's a phrase that like just always is popping into my head mm -hmm. because it's like when I'm trying to remind myself, hey, you need to check in on people. Just because yeah. I'm always, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen is they don't text you back or they don't email you back. And 90 percent of the time, it's not even because they're they don't want to. It's just because mm -hmm. they're busy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people forget. Yeah. Like I've had yeah. I've had so many times where someone's like, oh, I meant to text you back. I was in the middle of texting you and someone called me on my walkie and mm -hmm. I forgot. And then I remembered yep. a month later that I hadn't actually texted you. Yeah. 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 So like from where you are now, what's something about this process that actually came as a surprise, like compared to what you thought as an LA freshman, I guess. Most people are willing to answer your questions. Mo you know what I mean? As long as, as long as you ask in the right way, you're aware of your surroundings when you're asking the questions or trying to quote unquote shoot your shot. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, uh, Cause Prentice, the, he's one of the showrunners on insecure. He did a Q and a on Instagram about that. And someone asked him a question about, you know, Oh, Hey, if I'm on set and I just wanted to try to, you know, pitch something to a, a PA, you know, shoot my shot. And Prentice literally said, never do that never pitch to it like don't ever pitch yourself to anyone on set especially if they're at work because you don't know what's going on and the lat you know you don't know mm. what's been going on right before that what's about to happen you don't know like you don't know mm. the 20 things that they may be dealing with in their head and the last yeah. thing they want to do yeah. is hear a pitch from somebody they don't know because he yeah. was like you know it's as because he was just like you know it's all about relationships and um yeah so that's you know the biggest thing is shoot your shot but be calculated about it i guess is that, <laughs> read the room and, and read read the room yeah that's yeah. the best way. read the room and also sometimes so you're not always going to be the right fit for every project mm -hmm. you know uh especially or with writing you know everyone i write a lot of drama i write way too many period pieces stuff that's just way too expensive but i also like write my modern dramas are very specific things mm. that are important to me and speak to me yeah, yeah. and not everyone's writing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So also, you know, be aware of the audience that you're targeting and be aware of, you know, the shows you were, you know, cause mm -hmm. like when I worked on Vita, you know, Vita is an LGBTQ targeted, you know, that's their audience. Like, and Tanya, Tanya Siracho, like she, she's, Fantastic. She's amazing. Super, super nice person. Yeah. The prod, the things that Tanya makes, like they're not like what she does and what I do very different. So it's like the, the kind of the idea that she wouldn't necessarily be the right person to approach with kind of the stories that I write because that's, she writes a lot of her stuff is like dramedy and I don't like, I'm terrible at comedy. I don't, you know, I don't do dramedy. Uh, <laughs> people tell me I'm funny. I'm not funny enough to write comedy scripts. I guess be aware of what you're trying to do and what other people are trying to do and if your voices are going to mesh and click. I don't know if that makes sense or not. You know, when you were on Home and Family, it wasn't a narrative show. And you're just like, okay, how can I get onto a narrative show at least, you know, because I, I did have a question about that. So you've been on a lot of TV shows and that's kind of been, you know, your bread and butter. And you just now gotten on, you, you had a narrative, right? Well, when I usually when I say narrative, I just, you know, storytelling so. oh but was it a feature i spent a week working on a feature they don't shoot as many features in los angeles mm -hmm. as they used to yeah they're trying to bring that back so what is your hope though i mean for for wanting to get closer to a writing gig what are your current strat strategies because like you know like right now you've moved to mm -hmm. narrative now that's great so but are you are you wanting to write features are you wanting to write like tv shows like what's your hope for that i write both okay all right Shot. Thanks. You can't box me in. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to be part of you. No, um, I'm always trying to make connections with other assistants and especially like showrunners assistants when I can. Yeah. The people that I like genuinely connected with for one reason or another. So like uh, Raul, who's been a guest on the show yeah. and I met him on Vita. Raul's just like 
a friend. Yeah. So he, he's you know, awesome. and he's yeah, and he's awesome, and he's a right, he's a writer, he's a writer who's moving up. You know, he has a manager now and stuff. Nice. So it's it's helpful to, like I said, it's helpful to meet people that are either just on your level or a little bit ahead of you mm-hmm. that want to do either the exact same thing as you or yeah. something similar to what you're doing. Because mm-hmm. what Raul and I write are very different, but mm-hmm. you know, he's a writer. He has a manager. He mm-hmm. knows how to get a manager, you know, yeah. that's, which is always helpful. And then one of my other good friends, uh, Jose, who I went to college with, he's currently the writer's PA on uh, Young Sheldon. So, you know, he's able to give me advice and, you know, give yeah. me insights and all that stuff. I'm semi-active on uh, writer screenwriting Twitter. I'm a lurker more than I'm a tweeter. <laughs> but, but you know, I follow... Uh, an agent and manager named uh, John Zalzerny, mm-hmm. who is like, he's a relatively like big time literary manager and agent. He's always just giving free advice there. Yeah. There's so many, like, I get a lot of advice from Twitter. And then, okay, and so also about Twitter. No, I do have a question about that. Where do people find the writers? Is it a specific hashtag that you guys use that like, you know, nobody else? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yes and no. Like, I don't really, I very rarely, like, put a hashtag in my tweets. Okay. <laughs> I don't have that many followers, and I get very, very few interactions. Oh, no, 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 like a hashtag but, that you search, but, though. But um, they do, like, a uh, hashtag pre-WGA is okay. for, like, a lot of a lot of up-and-coming writers who haven't gotten into the guild yet. If you have a favorite show, look up the writer or the creator or something and mm-hmm. just search them. On yeah. Twitter, you know. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. A, po- a screenwriting podcast that uh, one of my buddies got me into a couple of years ago, uh, The Children of Tendu. It's over. It's ended now. But, mm-hmm. you know, I follow those guys, and those guys have been in the business for 30 years. Mm-hmm. You know, they've written on some of the, you know, one of them was a writer on the first season of Lost, and he was mm-hmm. a writer on the second season. You know, he's written, and one of them, like, was the creator and producer of uh, The Middleman. Okay. And okay. so just those guys have just they just gave like just literally oceans of advice and mm-hmm. pra- just practical knowledge. And a bunch of it is stuff you just you cannot learn in film school. It's stuff mm-hmm. you can literally only learn by being in L.A. and mm-hmm. being in the business. If you're chasing screenwriting. Yeah, yeah. And they just gave it out for free. There's, you know, six or seven years of just free screenwriting knowledge you're getting to see these working writers who are like high up writers you know these guys are showrunners sometimes or strong number twos Mm -hmm. that are helping the showrunners and they're just giving out free advice yeah i've learned so much so all right i'm kind of piggybacking on that like you learn a lot from observing obviously (sighs) i imagine that seeing actors work with a script has given valuable insight to oh yeah what does and doesn't work when you're first like putting it on the page definite definitely i mean because i've i've been on sets before where an actor literally is like this line just not working and the director's like yeah i agree and then they'll just change it and sometimes it's helpful because i've been on you know when i'm on insecure most shows that i've been on whoever wrote the episode is usually on hand when they're on set Mm -hmm. just in case they need to change a line or change something in the scene yeah so they can kind of just do it on the fly yeah yeah yeah. um and i see that a lot and then i've seen sidebar conversations with a-list actors and the writer sometimes they're heated and sometimes they're not you know (laughs) i can imagine that like something it would just be like all right this is just really awkward to say and this is just like a surface thing that is super easy but then there's other stuff that goes like way deeper as in like this change would actually change this part and this scene Mm -hmm. and this character arc and everything like how deep are you allowed to go uh well thankfully i've never been on a set where they just (laughs) change some motivation or something that's so crazy that they're just like oh we're done. We're, we we got to scrap the whole thing today. Good night, <laughs> folks. Like that's never happened to me. Okay. Okay. Th- right. Thankfully. Yeah. I mean, although most of the time, if that had happened, I think the crew would just be like, "Yeah, we got a seven, <laughs> a- we got an eight-hour day, and they're gonna pay us for the full twelve. Yeah. This is great, you know." No, I've never seen anyone upset that we had to go home early. Yeah, I, I haven't seen anything super crazy like that mm-hmm. on the shows that I've been on, at least. Yeah, I've like I said, I've seen a few heated discussions here and there, but I've never seen 
just straight up like this whole thing is not working we got to scrap it yeah yeah yeah. well I, I mean i was curious how that kind of went into your own writing were there any kind of cues that you just kind of picked up along the way um, that was just like huh maybe maybe i won't do that with my character or like maybe this actually wouldn't work the biggest thing that i've learned is uh writing an exterior scene at night just adds an immediate complication to mm. the product that and children yeah kids yeah. kid because because as a background pa to you know when you have kids you have you know you can only work kids for a certain amount of time they also have to do school while they're on set so you have a teacher that you have to bring to set and then you're always like a lot of times the goal is to bring the kids in early enough that you can get the school in so that you can take care of their whole school and then get them to set and then once they've worked their legal different age groups are only allowed to be on or only allowed to be working on set for a certain amount i think babies mm -hmm. is like two hours yeah and yeah, they make, yeah babies make gobs of money to work two hours <laughs> just gobs of money it is unfair they don't even know that they're working and they're making like so much money it's ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous yeah <laughs> those are things that like i've learned from like genuine practical aspects adding children just adds an extreme mm -hmm. complication well i mean if you're wanting to sell your script it's a big deal you know Ex um, exactly exactly so you know and i wrote a feature that had a baby in it and it had a child in it but the baby is literally in the first scene and then never seen again and then the kid is only in like three scenes so the kid only has yeah. like six lines six mm -hmm. or eight lines throughout the whole movie mm -hmm. enough to make it significant but yeah. not an, not enough to add like a zillion extra complications yeah. it's not like you know? stranger things so it's, like, yeah it's, it's just like it's just things that and and i will say that that is one benefit of being an actual production even though in some ways it can be harder to get facetime with writers and producers and stuff by being on set but at the same time because I've gotten to work on a variety of different shows, I know when I'm writing things, I know what I'm asking of the crew and what I'm asking of the producer to come up with. Yeah. And sometimes yeah, yeah. I write stuff that I'm just like, I know that this is what I'm asking you and I know it's going to be amazing. <laughs> but also, you know, I've been on shoots where it's just like the amount of stuff that that it's going to take just to get that whole day is involving easily 30 to 40 people coming in at 3 a.m. in the morning and yeah. regular crew in order to start prepping and getting all the extras in. So it's like the hair, makeup, and wardrobe people, excuse me, costumes, the uh, hair, <laughs> hair, makeup, and costumes, PAs and ADs are literally coming in at 3.30 in the morning yeah. and crew call might not be until 6 a.m. So like the actual 12 hours or the actual six hours before your first meal break doesn't actually start until 6 a.m. when Aye. the rest of the crew gets there. But you've been on the clock since 3.30 or 4. Yeah. And, then, and then that also involves you getting up at 2 or 2.30, you know, Mercy. depending on depending on where you're shooting. So it's kind of just being aware that has been very helpful for me yeah. because I'm I'm aware of the kinds of complications that you're adding when you're mm -hmm. ask when you're putting in just little things. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask you about some game changing tools of your trade. If you, like, if there are if there are any, I was just saying because um, like it doesn't have to be like I mean I would love you know gear gadget and you know software or you know whatever. Yeah. But like I remember somebody saying to me like because I was I was doing international gigs and somebody had mentioned they're like dude biggest game changer take an inflatable camping pad because you have to sleep in the airport and stuff like that I, like oh. I had never thought about it and it seriously was a game that's, changer that's interesting yeah it's I like never... the crazy thing so I mean it's just like as your life as you know PA slash writer well software. It's always controversial in 2021, but I'm still a I'm still a proponent of final using Final Draft. I like Final Draft. When they were doing Adobe Story, I did enjoy Adobe Story, but like Final Draft has been the go-to. You know, when I I bought my first copy of Final Draft, I think in eighth or ninth grade, because uh -huh. I knew I yeah. wanted to be a screenwriter way back yeah, then, yeah. and I used a, a I used my high school ID to 
you had a student discount. Yeah. Well, what's a um, what's a quirk of um, Adobe's that you didn't like then? I don't even remember it because it's been so long. I don't even think does Adobe Story exist anymore. I don't even know. I don't, I don't know. even know. I, like the ones that I know of are just like Final Draft and like Celtics. I have never met anyone in my life who was like, yeah, I wrote this script on Celtics, <laughs> and it sold. You know, <laughs> and I, you know what I mean. I've never, and on screenwriting, I've never in my travels across screenwriting Twitter, <laughs> I've never, heard, I've never seen anyone who actually makes money writing ever mention anything about Celtics. Interesting. Because like, Celtic, I mean, however. it's like, it's formatting, right? So like, what I, what exactly is the, the I don't know. I just think, I mean, final draft has always been the industry standard. I think yeah. there's, I think there's a cup, there's like two or three other uh, softwares out there. I don't even remember okay. their names that, that professional screenwriters are using as well. Uh-huh. Um, but because like they I have said, to like deliver the files, I guess, huh? Yeah. That's the big thing. And okay. obviously, obviously, don't write a don't write a screenplay on Microsoft Word. <laughs> it should be obvious, but I'm sure there's people <laughs> out there that maybe maybe need to invest in Final Draft now. Yes, I don't know. Yes, but I should. Just I shouldn't in case, laugh. I shouldn't laugh. I, <laughs> yeah, but just in case. If you're trying to get in the PA world, you should always go to Film Tools and pay that sixty dollars or whatever it is to get yourself a surveillance headset for your walkie. You don't want to be that person who shows up to set and goes, hey, uh, do you guys have any surveillances? Because they, people, they hate giving them out. They hate giving them out because really? they're expensive. They're expensive. Uh, and when you're, rent, when you're renting a walkie package, you know, they charge you for every surveillance that's not returned. And they charge you for every walkie that's not returned. Mm-hmm. And walkies can run up to like $600 a walkie. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so... It's just one of those things. That oh, okay. No, that's good to know because I didn't know that um, they didn't give you surveillance. Cause yeah, they'll I, yeah, hook I, you up with. They'll hook you up with what's called a referred to as a, a Burger King. Okay. And it's just the it's, it's literally <laughs> it's like the the, 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 the headset happy. mic, yep. and you don't look. They're not. They're not that fashionable. I don't know if there are any favorite new gadgets that like really revolutionize how you work. For actually, for background, a program that I've been using on the last two shows that I was on, it's called uh, RABS. And so it's short for run a better set. Ooh. And what it does is it's all, it's digital vouchers okay. for all the background. So, um, Oh wow. And the vouchers are basically, you know, that's the daily time cards. And so for years and prior to the pandemic, I think RABS have been around a little bit before the pandemic, mm-hmm. but I got introduced to it in 2020 so it hadn't been i don't think it's been around that long but essentially it has all literally all the information for all the vouchers so essentially you can do instead of having 60 or 80 or sometimes 200 individual paper vouchers Mm. for signing people in and out every day Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can literally all do that with the push of a button so it's an app it's uh it's an app and a website. Okay. Um, it's mostly a website, and then for sets that are working with extras a lot, that's mm-hmm. been a very helpful thing. Because if you I have to go back awesome. and um, if you have to go back and like adjust something, mm-hmm. you can go back and do that with the push of a button and fix it right there. Because also at the end of the night, you have to do what's called a breakdown. Mm-hmm. So it's essentially categorizing all these different vouchers by their in and out time. Like their meal penalties, if they got them, if they were given a prop or something, or if they were around smoke, Ooh. if they were around someone, if they were around smoking, if they were around someone that was smoking, or if they were using like a fog machine. Oh, yeah. Uh, depending wow. on, you know, that counts as what's called a smoke bump. So they get a little extra money for that. And so that immediate, like just having that one difference immediately puts them into a separate category for accounting. Okay. So, Sometimes you might have like 30 categories on like crazy, crazy days. You might have 30 individual categories for accounting to look at for processing the payroll for the background. Yeah. And prior to the digital vouchers, which the industry slowly it's it's at a turtle pace (laughs) kind of moving towards it. But it's like prior to that you'd have to organize all the vouchers at the end of the night after you signed all these people out so we might wrap it it says a night shoot we might wrap at 5 a.m mm-hmm. might take you another 
hour, hour and a half, potentially, depending on how many extras you have to get everyone back to base camp yeah. out of their costumes. If they had costumes, then sign them all out. And then you have to organize all the vouchers. Mercy. And that's by oh, like, my stars. Mercy. That's by that's by the SAG background and the non-union background. And then you have to organize the categories and blah, blah, blah. Then you have to calculate the meal penalties if they got a bunch of meal penalties. Thankfully, not non-union background only gets one meal penalty, but SAG background every 30 minutes past their first meal penalty, they get another meal penalty. So you have to start calculating that. The stand-in actors are also on vouchers Mm -hmm. and you have to organize it by the most expensive. There were times on Euphoria where we had like hundreds of extras and it's Mm -hmm. seven in the morning Mm -hmm. and you're in Mm -hmm. in Santa Clarita, which (laughs) is like an hour north of Los Angeles almost, depending on traffic. And the morning dew is coming in and all this stuff. So the tables are getting wet and you're literally stacking paper vouchers on table on a table that's literally getting wet completely out of your control. You can dry it off and it may continue to start getting wet. And so it's just having the electronic vouchers prevents you having to do that. And honestly, it saves a lot of time. It's such a fantastic day. Yeah, it saves a lot of time and manpower, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh. And money. Ultimately, it saves the production money because because it's easier to do that in the click of a button. And if you have to go back and change it or fix something, you can just make the adjustment with the click of a button later oh, instead amazing. of paying seven other people to stay on the clock for another hour, hour and yeah. a half. And some of the, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Seriously. Oh, that's amazing. What current project are you excited about? One of the ADs that I've worked for often on the last couple of years is working on the TV show Barry. With, with Bill Hader, and I love Barry. I, I, I'm a huge fan of that show. And I'm trying to, like, I'm like, hey, Aaron, if you need, if you need people, yeah. let me know. Yeah. And she yeah. already, you know, so I'm hoping that in this next, but they're shooting until December, so I'm hoping that between now and then I'll get to go work on that. And then Euphoria, nice. I'm working on Euphoria uh, tomorrow, actually. Nice. So I'm working on Euphoria tomorrow. Uh, with some of the 80s from that. And so that'll be cool to see some people. It's also a crazy show. It's just there's always a lot of moving parts on that show because mm-hmm. it's a great show. And, you know, the the better a show is sometimes, the harder it can be to make. Barry is the big thing that I'm really hoping to get yeah. to work on. Because, I, like I said, I love that show. Yeah, yeah. Bill Hader is fantastic. <laughs> um, and obviously the great Henry Winkler. Mm-hmm. I've seen him in the flesh before at a movie mm-hmm. theater. He was eating popcorn with his wife off by himself, so we did not bother him. <laughs> but I'd love to actually, you know, get to be around him when he's working. So that's, yeah. uh, those are the two big things. So how do people find or follow your work? Shameless, shameless plug up. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. But like I said earlier, I'm more of a lurker than a tweeter. <laughs> hey, well, people, um, like, sometimes, like, people have gotten in touch. Right, at BJ Passinger. Mm-hmm. I'm the, I'm the only I'm the only person on there that has that name, so it shouldn't be too hard to find me. <laughs> but if you, if you do send me a, if you do send me a DM or anything like that, uh, just let me know that you heard me on Tanya's podcast. So I don't <laughs> think you're just like a random person. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to follow me. If unintentionally you DM me on Twitter and I accidentally leave you on red, just know I was probably on set and in the middle of something <laughs> and I genuinely probably forgot. Like, don't <laughs> yeah. don't take it too personal. That means that the squeaky wheel needs to get the grease, so be, exactly. be squeaking. <laughs> be, be squeaking, but don't scream. What questions should I have asked you? I think pretty much all the advice I could ever give, I've poured out, I've poured my heart out already. <laughs> Okay. Other than oh, um, you know, always memorize those breakfast orders. Yeah. And and if if a hot snack comes out on set, go ahead and offer that to the AD. Go ahead, take a quick picture of the menu. Go to the assistant director and or whatever AD you see on set. Just go up to them and say, "Hey, this is what they got. You want anything?" Ooh, that is a good tip. And then they and then maybe maybe just maybe they'll delegate you to get the director the director or the producer a snack. And maybe they'll remember your name and maybe they won't. But, you know. <laughs> no, but, but it's still really know, good enough. <laughs> one, one, one day you could get uh, Steven Spielberg some pizza rolls on set. You know, you don't, you know, 
That could be you. That could be your life. One day. There you go. Anyway, thank you so much for all the wisdom. And like, honestly, like you probably have more to offer than uh, some, you know, like you've said this a couple of times, you know, get to know the people who are on the same trajectory and pretty much on the same level as you. I mean, I, I, I've said this before because somebody had mentioned it. Um, your mentor is being two years ahead of you instead of 20. Yeah. Scorsese and Spielberg and George Lucas, like all those guys knew each other when they were like young hotshot directors or like trying yep. to be hotshot direct. Like they'd have yeah. drinks and get burgers together and stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's yeah. just like those things where it's like when they're like, oh, I'm never going to get a directing job or I'm never going to get a directing job again. Mm-hmm. You know, back mm-hmm. back when Hollywood was pumping out 30 movies a year, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's just like one of those things where, you know, that's that's an idea that that uh, I think that's a universal truth of the industry, honestly, Mm -hmm. that really genuinely goes back all the way to the very beginning of the industry, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate all of the fantastic advice that you have given. That is very valuable. Glad I could help. If you enjoyed this interview, follow us right here and on Instagram and check out more episodes at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. If you have comments or questions, feel free to email me, tanya at thepracticalfilmmaker.com or DM me on Insta. Be well and God bless. We'll see you next time on The Practical Filmmaker.